What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pixelist Podcast, a podcast about all the nerdy things we love and enjoy. As always, we're your hosts. That's Blake. I'm Will. And today we're here to talk a little bit of Critical Role. But before we do that, you guys know the drill by now. We have our awkward introduction. <laughs> <laughs> awkward introduction segment of the pod um and just yeah welcome my friend good to sit down with you and we just i was about to ask like how are you doing but I, we literally just did that before we sat down so i was like ah it feels disingenuous so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do it but what i will tell you is that i've got my coffee this time nice a nice little little cute cup you got there yeah yeah this one was yeah. actually um Ashley's, but it's one of my new faves. Yeah, that's a good one. Sorry, I'm fixing my my microphone volume because I naturally, as soon as we hit record, it like went down. So anyway, yeah, I got a couple of coffee mugs I really like to use. You know, a couple of yeah. go-tos. It makes you, the coffee taste better. I think so. It enhances yeah. the experience at least because I've got some that I really don't like. But, you know, when dishes are kind of piled up a little bit, sometimes you just got to go to those. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know, it, I, don't, I don't know how to quantify it, but I definitely, it feels like it is an enhancer. It makes it better, especially if it's yeah. too small of a mug. I don't know if you have that issue. But you're like, saying you like that or? No, 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 I don't like that. Oh, okay. I don't know if you're saying like, you like kind of like a little cappuccino type of, no. type of feel or something. No, because I mean, not, it's not like literally too small where it's like pouring out, but it's like so yeah. close. You have to like meticulously you don't yeah. worry about it for the first 15 minutes um definitely if i like pull my mug off the coffee maker and it like spills i'm like i have like kind of like a yeah. uh, like moment <laughs> of just crisis it's the so. worst because one it's like hot and it probably burned yeah. you and then yeah. it's all sticky on your mug and now and yeah oh no i don't let that <laughs> set i and when you i don't know if you ever play enough kids but we have baby wipes everywhere. So which baby wipes aside from kids, pretty useful yeah. little thing. Part of me wonders if they're pretty bad for the environment though. I don't know. We don't flush them. I know you're not supposed to flush them. And even though the ones that you, they say you can flush, you shouldn't flush. Mm. But anyway, you pop out one of those baby wipes, wipe down the mug. Mm. Boom. Clean. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah, that's actually a game changer. I think we do like have some, but we definitely don't have them like easily accessible yeah. everywhere. If I'm feeling real bold, I'll turn on the sink, bring my coffee mug over to the stream oh. just to get the water on the side. But it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a little, it's when I'm feeling really wild because you yeah. know, you're risking the water going into the coffee. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I'm glad we see eye to eye on this, but yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's important to have good favorite mugs. Yeah. Um, and that's, if you get nothing else out of today's episode, yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited to dive in today. We do have some announcements. A um, couple of things, two big ones that come to mind. Uh, one, we're having a watch party on Sunday night at 7.30 Central Time this Sunday, and I'll put the event up in the Discord. Um, we are watching an amazing movie called Sicario, the same director who did Dune, did a movie with Emily Blunt, uh, I guess it was maybe like six or seven years ago, called Sicario. Uh, it's an amazing movie. It was a so lot longer the... than that at this point. Oh, was it? I guess right. it was, yeah. I lose track of things, man. I do too. So I'm like, yeah, that was like five years ago. Then I'm like, it was 15 <laughs> years ago? <laughs> 2015, so almost 10 years ago. Oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, <laughs> goodness. Well, anyway, we'll be watching that. And then, by the way, a plug for the Discord. Um you know, if you like talking Critical Role, if you like talking D&D, Worlds Beyond, Daggerheart, whatever it may be, definitely you're going to want to join the Discord. We have a pretty awesome, positive community there as well. Um, and then, if you didn't catch the news, we're doing a D&D one-shot with you guys, our subscribers. That will be on Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Central Time. And that will not be on YouTube. That will be in the Discord as well. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that, we're doing the giveaway this Friday at our Friday end of week stream. Um, so sign up for that in the discord and then we'll do the, we'll announce the winners at our Friday stream. Yeah. So you got three days if, if you're watching this podcast, the day we put it out. So, um, you know, depending on your, your listening schedule for the pixelists, you may still have time if you haven't, um, clicked up yet. So yeah, definitely do. We're, we're really excited. Um, 
And yeah, I'm excited for this Friday to to do the drawing, as it were. Do you know what class you're going to roll? No. This, but, should we even broach this subject? I Well, because here's what I was going to do. I was going to, since we're kind of doing this for everyone else, yeah. once we have our players and they know what they want to play, I was going to kind of like slot fill. Yeah. Like, like so if nobody in, played a healer, I'd play a healer yeah, type of thing. Like if we have like five barbarians <laughs> yeah well like, oh, honestly maybe. at that point i just have to go barbarian and we just oh, yeah. commit <laughs> we commit to the bit but yeah but yeah so i have some ideas for like the character but yeah no nothing as far as like the class and stuff yeah i'm excited for it i'm really keen to see what people come up with um or and we may have people who've never played before maybe they want a character provided so maybe yeah. i could even provide a few options but yeah we could do that too anyway i'm really excited for all of that coming together um uh starting this friday and then like i said on april 12th is i think it's the 12th um it's a yeah, friday april right 12th. yeah april yeah. 12th um doing that so anyway yeah me too man um uh other announcements i don't I don't think so. Did it Disney put out a new trailer for The Acolyte? Have you heard of the show? I the I, show? I saw a poster for it which looked yeah, cool. The trailer dropped about an hour ago. It's with Carrie Ann Moss um mm. of Matrix fame and many other things, but looks pretty interesting. So it good? It sure. does, but I I just don't really watch shows as much as i used to yeah it's typically like way after like when i watched andor it was this last summer so it had been out for yeah. a while um, have you seen andor by the way i know i haven't i need to andor is really good that's what that i've heard pretty, that one has some pretty amazing uh pretty amazing acting in it they're making uh, a second season aren't they they are yeah for next year i think okay. is what it is but yeah i heard that was good anyway so well, all right. Well, um, with that out of the way, let's just jump on into it. And for anybody new around wait, here, wait, wait, oh. <laughs> awkward as always, I got to hit record <laughs> and scene. All right. Well, let's just get on into it. For anybody new around here, what we like to do is give a in-depth recap of the episode before we dive into our discussion so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and we actually cut that recap out, host it separately on YouTube for your viewing convenience. So if you are on just the recap and you want to catch Blake and I's full discussion on the episode, it will be linked down in the description below. So let me pull up my notes here and let's dive into, oh, I don't know the title. Do you know the title, by the way? By the King's tape? Edition. Okay. Then which is episode 88 of campaign three. So, we pick up with Bell's Hells hiding in this basement where we left them in the previous episode. The basement of the Jagged Edge, which was like this kind of blacksmithy shop sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> they're hiding down here uh, because there's basically a lot of heat on them from a previous battle they had just had in the middle of the street. So Laudna casts darkness and everybody basically just gets silent and stops moving. Uh, they can hear the footsteps above its guards basically investigating all the commotion from earlier. <clears throat> and um, they're just, you know, trying to bide their time and see if they can coast on out of here. Um, but eventually they hear the hatch to the basement begin to open. And one of the guards is one of those Sasquatch creatures that we still don't have a proper name for, I don't think. <clears throat> and he's kind of confused by just the the darkness that he sees when he looks below. So he whistles and one of these um, tunnel worm type creatures that the party had seen previously shows up and it's, you know, been domesticated, if you will. Maybe not. That's not the right word, but trained yeah. um, <clears throat> to work with the Vanguard and it basically sends it in to go investigate the darkness. And um, we come to find out that these things don't have eyes, but rather they have some sort of like sensory gland on their face. So, you know, a tremor sense as well. So investigating in the darkness for them is easy. So it comes down here, starts searching around. We have to make a group stealth check. Um, everyone rolls pretty well, <clears throat> except for Fern and FCG, with Fern rolling a nat one. And 
So the party's kind of nervous and Ladna is kind of like front and center with how they're positioned. And so she kind of watches this creature just burrow down and disappear into the earth. And next thing she knows, it just bursts out of a nearby wall as it's just investigating. So she has to make like, I think an athletics check or something to kind of like nimbly move so that it doesn't like run into her when it's bursting out. And she successfully does. Um, <clears throat> so the creature then make some sort of noise to communicate with the, the guard up top and the guard says, okay, well then come back up. So seemingly the worm was like nothing down here, but right after that happens, two more of these worms burst out of other parts of the wall. So clearly there's like a team of these things that we're investigating. Um, so we have to have Imogen and Fern also make athletics checks to see if they can dodge. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, Imogen fails. So this worm realizes there's something here and it just starts biting down on her head. And so like, they're trying to be quiet. So she doesn't like scream. She doesn't move. She just lets this thing like start eating her head. Um, Lana can see this happening. So she tries to distract this worm with one of the dead Ryloran fingers that they have. <clears throat> and she actually rolls a nat 20. So this is successful. Um, but basically as soon as it, finishes eating the finger she threw it just runs back to Imogen mm -hmm. so at this point Imogen I think is continuing to roll like really poorly so she just like starts to attack it but even that fails and at this point we just roll initiative because the thing like had started to eat the whole top half of her body <laughs> um I think uh we find out that these things are actually called slithers at this point so right Fern uh wild shapes into one with the plan being that she is going to go upstairs and pretend to be the one that they're fighting down here so that nothing seems amiss as far as the guards are concerned. Uh, so she goes up and does that and rolls like a really high performance check. So sells it. And um, <clears throat> then they basically start to leave the guards and the, the other slithers. Uh, meanwhile, down in the basement, the party is, you know, fighting this one slither that's still down there pretty quick in combat. All things considered, they, end up taking care of it. Um, and afterwards, Ladna drops the darkness and FCG goes and heals Imogen who, you know, took some substantial damage. Um, <clears throat> they reconvene with Zesh who is like really surprised that they didn't get caught. And um, then Ashton FCG. And I think a few of them actually start asking more about the glass weapons that are here. Meanwhile, though, Fern is leading the rest of these guards and stuff a few blocks away. And then she like, slithers up to a nearby door and kind of like barks like saying like something's interesting here we should check this out so all of the other slithers follow her lead and then burrow underground to like go investigate this house so fern also burrows underground but instead of going there she doubles back to head back to the party um and she actually gets lost and fcg has to help like navigate her back but eventually they all get back and um <clears throat> meanwhile the party has i think bought a few of them have bought some of these glass weapons. I think Orem checks out a sword. Um, Laudna gets a couple of daggers that she plans on putting on Shishimi. And I believe Ashton gets like a new gauntlet or, or something to that effect. And oh, and finally, FCG gets like a, a gem uh, imbued in their chest to serve as like a mood ring, basically, to show when hit the their stress levels are going crazy. Um <clears throat> A uh, also during this time checks the scry ball and sees that Odahan is still in the middle of the city. Um, so Fern at this point is back. And so she takes the chest that they actually got in the previous episode uh, during the battle where the Ryloran juggernaut was carrying a cart that had a chest in it. So that same chest, she takes it downstairs um, to dispel magic on it. She does. So the protections shatter. Uh, Chet then locks pick lock picks this and inside is this hexagonal device that is similar to ones they've seen at, around the Malleus key um, that were like dispelling the magic. Uh, but this one is seemingly much more refined, uh, but it also looks rough as if it's like maybe very old or it's just, you know, been handled poorly. Um, Lana, I think, makes an Arcana check at first and gets a nat 20 and is like, yeah, this thing disrupts abjuration magic. Uh, and it's very similar to something you've seen before. And she realizes that the runes on it uh, remind her of the same runes she saw in Imahara Joe's shop when he was working on FCG. So this is like ancient Aeorian technology. And that's where we go to break on the first half. Awesome, man. 
So coming back, um, they also get some of the um, Meridian glass that uh, Zesh's shop seems to specialize in. Uh, and they find out, um, which you already mentioned, they had gotten the different weapons, but uh, Chetney specifically also got a scythe on top of that. Um, and they find out some special properties about this glass. Um, first of all, namely that uh, they crit on an attack roll of an 18 to 20. Uh, additionally, once they do crit, uh, they have to roll a 1d6, and it's through this that the glass may break permanently, being glass and all. Um, it also, this glass has special advantages when within 60 feet of a um, psych psychonic person, a psych psychically gifted person, i.e. Imogen, um, and these benefits make the weapon more likely to hit. Uh, the target, when struck, then has disadvantage on certain saves. Um, and uh, also, the glass will always glow as well, almost like kind of like a moon touch broadsword, was kind of the impression I got. Um, you mentioned already the box that they looked at, um, and they essentially decide wh where should we go next. Let's go check out the Overspoke, which the Overspoke was the tower that they were told to go to the top of and basically ask for Erot to then find like the location of like the Volition Hidden Base. So they head to the Overspoke and they're trying to decide like what to do, like how to best like this whole this whole episode in the previous episode has been all about like how do we get past like the city guard and things like that. Uh, Chetney's going to hand over his toy that can charm someone. Uh, and ultimately, Imogen just sort of pretends to be Liliana. Uh, she approaches the tower, and they immediately are like, oh, we didn't know you were coming. And it's very much like, don't ask me about my business. You know, you're beneath me. Uh, and Imogen decides to head to the top of the tower. Uh, Ladna accompanies her almost like a bodyguard. I think Ladna also casts like Unsettling Presence to kind of help with this as well. Um, they make it all the way to the top of the Overspoke, and there is Aerot. And Aerot's kind of a quirky fellow. Um, it's implied later on that despite them being in this city with many telekinetically um, or psychic uh, inhabitants, that maybe Aerot isn't as gifted in that way. And possibly, like, this is now, like, sort of his lowly job, you know, being at the top of this, uh, the Overspoke. Um, similar to what we saw down below, uh, Imogen's implying herself to be Liliana, and they begin looking for this purple flag out across the city that's supposed to mark um, the entrance to the Volition's secret base. Uh, they borrow a spyglass from Erot. They eventually do see this purple flag. Um, they then leave, make their way out with the whole party. Chetty gets his toy back. And they eventually all get to a space that's kind of like Matt almost it almost sort of describes it to be kind of like a junkyard of just an, an enormous amount of um, discarded rock and earth. Like whenever like a tunnel's being built, like all that stone has to go somewhere. And it's kind of like a landfill of all of that stuff. Um, at this place, this really squirrely character comes out who's very nervous, um, again, immediately assumes Imogen to either be Liliana or be related to Liliana, and this is Watcher Amido. It is very much like the, um, the farthest out um, eyes for the Volition to make sure no one's approaching. Uh, they announce that they're here to meet the Volition, that they're not with the uh, Imperium, and to um, basically trust them to uh, go meet the rest of the uh, Volition's forces. Uh, there's many great roles that happen in this point. Uh, Amido, in terms of persuasion, Amido finally um, leads them down into the tunnel. Um, they have to also enter through... Uh, I think it was like one by one or two by two, like just not to draw any eyes or things like that. Um, they get led down this tunnel um, and they eventually, it's kind of like, this is a really big throwback, but really early on in Drusar, when they were down like in like, kind of like the subway-ish kind of feel of the city where they went and met, um, wasn't the Immortal Syndicate, it was the other one. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Um... 
I know what you're what talking about. Dorian's, Dorian's brother was part of. Yeah. Well, oh. in that episode, they were sort of led through like this winding corridor and it opened up into like this chamber with like tons of the the people there. Yeah. This is kind of what happens. Amido leads them down this long tunnel. It opens up into this large chamber and it is essentially a chamber full of all of these members of the volition. And they kind of circle around Bell's Hells, including one particular person, Rashina, who is known as the Golden Hammer and is the leader of the Volition. Rashina immediately notices Imogen's likeliness uh, or uh, likeness uh, compared to Liliana and basically says, like, hey, so what's the deal with that? And Imogen's like, yeah, that's my mom. Um, Matt describes weapons being drawn, like people being very nervous. And again, with some perception checks, some very high rolls, uh, they convince Rashina that they're not part of uh, the Ruby Vanguard, and more importantly, that they're not a an unknowing weapon of the Weave Mind. Um, Rashina basically says, you know, that's enough for us to go on from now. Um, and also mentions, I think it was the five masters of the Weave Mind or the five lords of the Weave yeah. Mind, but essentially these five characters who are presumably like the core characters of the weave mine uh and then leads them over to like this large like opaque wall of glass uh rashina waves her hand the glass becomes transparent and it is here where we actually see the true heart of Craviris, this basically massive sprawling city underground buildings bridges uh very um you know, I was going to say Dune Modir, but that's not right. But very much like Mines of Moria kind of vibe yeah. to it. Um, and this central spire with glowing crystals in the center of this massive expanse, presumably, maybe, where Pradathos is housed. Uh, and that is where our episode comes to an end. Episode 88, Seeking Sedition. So... Mm -hmm. um, if you're watching just the recap, we have a link in the description for the full episode breakdown. We want to know what you think about it as well. So click the link and check that out. Anyhow. Pop, pop. Well done. Well okay. done. So I got distracted because I had my son literally just screaming outside my door. <laughs> it just does that, man. He just comes to the door. And so I was mid recap. I was distracted because I was calling Joy to be like, hey, if you can just <laughs> check on that. Um, <laughs> no worries. I know. could not hear it. That's good. Um. So <laughs> he's fine, by the way. He just <laughs> I likes to announce his presence by screaming. <laughs> so I get it. Anywho, um, fun app. Yeah, you know, um, and some cool items too. I liked the yeah. disruptor thing, and then also this radiant glass. I think anything that makes combat just a little bit more interesting is kind of cool. Um, and very powerful items. A crit, it may not seem like it, but a crit on an 18, 19, or 20 is is very powerful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. some cool Which, flavor in this app. I speaking of that, I was... Um, my first understanding was that the 18 through 20 crit, um, and then you said, then you roll like a 1d6, right? Yeah. I think if you roll a 1 on a d6, it breaks. Okay, because for some reason I thought it was that like 18 through 20 crits, but 1 through 6 breaks. Like on the D20. Oh. But I, I I, am not confident in that because it's not. I wasn't like hyper-focused paying attention, but that's just what yeah. I wrote down. But like mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what it is. Um, I like that though. In for, for the way you understood it, do you only roll the D6 when you crit? I mean, it could be anything, right? It's a very high risk, high reward item, which I'm a fan of. So if I'm personally balancing it, I'm probably, I mean, flow of the game, it's kind of clunky to roll a D6 every time. I'm probably treating it like a normal weapon. And then if it crits, you know, roll a, roll a D6. Yeah. Cause um, I kind of, I that kind of makes sense. Cause it's like, like maybe the, the impact of the crit is what's threatening right. it to break type of thing. Let me just see if the wiki has it uploaded yet. Um, I think you. I think the way you described it would make more sense. Um, because the oh no, you are right though. 
and a crit is an 18 to a 20, but if you roll a one to six, it can, it will shatter. Dang. So high, high reward, but even higher risk really. Yeah. Um, Which I'm, I'm pretty, this is probably like the loosest rule I play with in combat when my party members change weapons, like they have the sword and then the creature like flies up and they're like, I want to take out my longbow. And you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty fair, like are pretty true to, you know, rules as written, whatever. But that's like the one thing where I'm just like, okay, cause we have six people in our, in our combat. So, you know, being like, yeah. oh, it takes an action to switch weapons. I don't know how you did it back in the day. I can't remember, but I also wonder for this group, like if the weapon breaks, are they going to have to spend an action to take out a new weapon or like, how's that going to work? I wonder. Yeah. I'm curious too. I don't really think that I don't feel like Matt is punishing to that degree, unless it's like an integral part of your class mechanics, like this just being like another weapon that they bought type of thing. Like, I don't think he would really like rake them over the coals for that. Yeah. Um, More so stuff like, you know, with like Percy having the gun or, you know, people having crossbows, it's like there's a reload right. mechanic and Matt does, you know, make sure that that's being followed. But I don't I don't really remember him ever being like, well, no, you got to spend your whole turn getting yeah. your axe out. And um, but even rules is written. I think those well, not the gun because it's homebrewed. But um, I think a crossbow actually has a reload time or heavy crossbow does. Um so that would even make sense. But yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, it does have a loading. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. In that case, the damage has been like balanced around that, you know? So if you just like presumed infinite ammo, like those weapons and those classes would probably be broken. Well, but is, is there, there's no downside to using these weapons, right? Which, what are you, are we talking about the glass weapons? Yeah. Just the chance that they'd break, I guess. Yeah. But then you could just go back to your other weapons. So, yeah. So, yeah, not, not really. I mean, yeah. Unless Matt does <laughs> make them take a turn to get the new one out type of thing. Yeah. Which, I which see- maybe he would for this type of situation. Yeah. Cause it almost feels like there's no reason not to use them otherwise. Right. Um, so, which know, maybe you can get like shards of glass in your eyes if you if it shatters. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, roll a sixty six. You're like, wait, what? What do you mean? <laughs> it's really sharp glass. Which they, yeah, I guess there's no, there's no real downside. I was just thinking about the the element that it like glows in the presence of things, but I mean, it's gonna be glowing twenty four seven because of Imogen. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, and I didn't mention it in the recap, but also within range of any of the other enemies that are telekinetic. Yeah, just basically like any Ruid is born, right? Yeah. And I mean, and they presumably also have um, these weapons too, so. And the, the, didn't they say that like Ruid is borns recharge them or something to that effect? Like. Not sure about I that. I don't remember what I'm talking about now, but I felt like there was something. I don't know. This is not. Important. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but while we're on this subject, I did think it was interesting that Orem got one. Because, you know, the whole campaign, he's been very mm. tied to his sword and his shield that he got from his. Yeah. His partner and his father. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think he's going to stop using seedling or anything but i still thought it was kind of like a important moment that like he took or i'm like took that step finally of like it almost kind of felt like you know what i gotta get the job done whatever it takes type of moment sort of i don't know if i'm reading too deeply into that i i mean i would normally say yes but liam is so like into those subtle details, yeah. I could totally see that being something of like, just like the slightest, not just like I got to get the job done, but just like, you know, steps of maturity. Like I have to move past my grief almost. And mm. um, just, I don't want to say move on. Cause that's even too strong of a, I don't think that was necessarily what was being said, but just like forward progress, I guess. Yeah. So I, I could see Liam being really keen 
on some kind of bot around that. I wonder if... Go ahead. Well, I just... And maybe even just wondering him seeing if anyone else noticed it, too. Yeah. Like, just doing an action to see what other people do, so... True. I wonder if... I wonder if he might even dual wield, like, seedling, glass blade. <clears throat> I don't really know enough about... I mean, fighters can definitely dual wield, I would assume, but... Yeah, I mean... I can't. I'm. I, the issue is, I played a fighter, and I can't. But it was like a homebrewed fighter, and I'm. I'm not able to remember what was core and what was part of the homebrew. Yeah. When I was um Mox with our other friends. Oh yeah. So I was a homebrewed fighter, so I I don't remember, but I re in the, at least the homebrewed one, you chose a fighting style, and that mm. was, um, like do wield was one of them. Yeah, but now I'm also kind of blending that with paladins. Paladins also at level two choose a fighting style. Yeah. And it's the same concept. It's like duelist or whatever. And, you know, we know in Worlds Beyond Number, for example, Ursulon, um, I presumably chose the sword and board um, thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm mixing classes or if they both have the same thing or, or what, but, um, so Orem presumably has something for my homebrewed class. I could change fighting styles if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember. I think while we're talking, I'm maybe going to look that up real quick. Cause I can't remember. I would imagine that as a, what, what level are they like 14? They're not that high. They're like level 12. Well, are they actually, I was gonna say level 12, but. Well, either uh, way, I think even if he doesn't have like the dual wielding fighting style, like he can absolutely dual wield. It just maybe wouldn't be as not have all the bells and whistles. I mean, just because I imagine that a a fighter that high level can like in their whole right. thing being able to use like any weapon basically. Yeah, or not any weapon, but you, you know, uh, I can't go to I can't go to crit roll stats to find out what they are. They um whoever whoever on. took them over. There's been that little message on the website for like a couple of months now that's saying like it's coming soon um which you know coming soon is a very relative term but yeah, I, 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 I check thing. every week and i'm like eh, not here yet yeah um man that's so such a <clears throat> bummer um yeah. level what's the most recent i think the level 12 i think yeah i think so would be my guess but um looking at a fighter uh martial archetype is what i'm thinking of um no and they do get a fighting style yeah okay and it is similar but not quite but yeah so i don't think <clears throat> let's see you can't take a fighting okay so maybe they get a fighting style again later but anyway it's it's not really much of the point other than just he could do a wield probably at some point if yeah. he wanted to but anyway which he's been oh uh oh okay we're, we're back messed up our screen for a second um this is nothing new for liam i would honestly well okay i'm not gonna go that far there's nothing new for liam though but he he's always been like one of the best at combat in the group and mm -hmm. I would say that not only just with descriptions, which I would say he probably is the best at, but just like literally like the, the strategy in combat. Um, and he's been showing that these last few episodes, man, like he's made such short work of like all like I think. So not this episode, but the one prior, like he just like basically one or two shot like these juggernauts like with. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I would love to see him dual wield and be able to do like, you know, even crazier amounts of damage potentially. Um, but yeah, um, just wanted to mention the sword thing. I thought that was a potentially kind of cool yeah. character moment. Um, no, that's that's good pointing out for sure. One thing uh, uh, going back to the very start of the episode with the whole slither in the dark moment, I was just thinking like, how like terrifying a scene would that be like in a horror movie yeah. where like every, like all group of friends is like staying still in the dark. And then you just start to see your one friend's head get eaten and like yeah. no one can scream because you can't like alert everyone else. And naturally Matt did such a great job of describing it with like sound effects and yeah. like, details. And 
Yeah, it was very um it was very good for sure. I um I wonder it, it you know, fingers crossed we get Bell's Hells animated, you know, in however many years from now. I think it'd be cool if they went for like a really like terrifying atmosphere during that moment. But you could also play mm-hmm. that moment for laughs too, depending on like how they want to go yeah. for it. Um, and we joked in the watch party if we were getting orgy 2.0 and sure enough like yeah. within five minutes sam <laughs> sam was like should we should we try this again yeah that was i'm glad that he remembered that was funny yeah <laughs> oh and so. speaking of um bell's hell's animated um this i'm gonna get there with the segue so don't worry but you know this was the ninth anniversary this episode of critical role which one is just crazy um, but two, I personally was, you know, kind of on my copium hoping that there may be a trailer or an announcement. Cause it just felt perfect. Like it's our nine year anniversary and here's the trailer for season three of legend of Vox Machina. Um, or at least some sort of announcement, but, uh, obviously we didn't get anything like that. So that just made me think like, it probably isn't even anywhere close now, I don't mean that it, that it means it's a year away necessarily, but yeah. I felt like if it was at all close, I feel like they would have worked to do something on the ninth anniversary. Um, yeah. So Sam I'm just curious, it. you know, Sam mentioned it on foresight of dive. Um, but literally it was they're like, he was like, we know you guys have been asking about this anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that clip. That was funny. Um, yeah. So... They said they were working on both, right? Yeah. Right. Interesting. Right. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think maybe there was some misinformation around this because there was some kind of detail about the writer strike not affecting uh, Legend of Vox Machina, yeah, yeah, or that it was like already done or something. But the fact that it's that was forever ago comparatively to now, um, so yeah, I agree with you. It doesn't seem like there's anything very soon. But I'm also I'm also wondering if maybe like our expectations were, I guess I guess whatever data point or detail that was like you know months ago it was like it's about to come out yeah and really it wasn't you know wasn't the case but yeah uh, I mean yeah, I think I wonder what's going on though yeah I, my my expectations were just built around the fact that you know season one and two were basically a year apart they both came out at the very beginning of the year. So, you know, you would just assume that the third one would follow that same pattern. But yeah, I think, I mean, I think it has to be the writer strike. Like, yeah. Um, if not directly impacting them, then the impact it had as a whole on like the industry or on Amazon and Amazon is wanting to like release things a certain way or something. But yeah, really curious. And one thing, or sorry, go ahead. No, that was basically it. I just, you know, Maybe. I assume it's not done and they're just not doing it for whatever reason. So I think they're either still working on it or it's like bureaucratic paperwork situation with with Amazon that's kind of holding them back as yeah. it were. It could be um it could be that that the latter there where like I, I just really like leaning into how they want CR to be like a brand you know, overall, um, I want, and we mentioned this on a previous episode. Like, I wonder if the way they've kind of worked it out is, you know, twice a year, we drop a season of critical role animated and, you know, we have our summer show legend of Vox Machina and our winter show, um, uh, mighty nine. So maybe, maybe the most recent season three was, done and they've just pushed it to this summer is kind of my copium that you know we're just kind of fine tuning it and we're getting a head start on on season four and then it'll drop the summer then mighty nine because i think didn't they say mighty nine was coming this year or am i making that up even i don't think they ever if they said that i didn't see them say okay. that okay um, i think i might just be making that up which <clears throat> gets me thinking about um the mandela effect are you familiar with that yeah yeah we like swear something happened. So yeah, I'm like, I swear something happened, but anyway, well, I don't know then. I, I just don't, I don't see them from like a brand point of view, releasing them close together. I mean, maybe they do. It just I seems like it's so, so much. 
Yeah, it just seems like it's so much better for their business for those things to be like two opposite sides of the year. Um, yeah, I don't even but, think they should release it until Vox Machina is over. But the fact that they're already working on it makes it seem like that's not they are going to release them. Yeah. Together. Yeah. So these cast members are just going to get busier and busier. <clears throat> I know, bro, they must they must be so insanely busy because they're also <laughs> full, like they also still like mo- I mean, I yeah. don't know about all of them, but have full careers, like very successful careers, completely devoid of critical role. Well, and doing um like Comic Cons in person and yeah. you know, presumably yeah. more live shows too. So yeah. yeah. I don't I don't know how they do it, man. <clears throat> yeah. Um, um, going back to this episode though, so they got the glass, they found this device, yeah, which I'm I don't know, about that. yeah, I don't know how, I don't, I don't know if this is like a Chekhov's gun kind of thing, or if like, it's more of like a, just like a detail or I don't know, like of what like the Vanguard's plans are. Um, cause there was some chatter in the discord too. And I, I can't place exactly what was said, but it was like, maybe these are going to be used to like re- release Pradathos, like dispel. <clears throat> yeah. You know? So, um, I don't necessarily see them like them themselves using this. I mean, maybe they do. I don't know, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I think they will use it, but I, and I know, I know exactly what you mean by Chekhov's gun. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the level of importance on it is in that way for Bell's Hells to use it. Right. But more so, it's like a, a piece of evidence to this larger picture, uh, especially yeah. considering this was a recon mission. Like, if they do go back, they can be like, hey, they're using these for something. Like you said, maybe it's to release Pradathos. Um, it's just interesting how it fits in the picture, right? Especially since it's Aorian. And mm-hmm. these were the things that were dispelling at the Malleus Key, right? Yeah, I think that was the implication, yeah. I'm wondering if maybe this, this, the fact that it was being transported from wherever to Gravirus, um, if maybe it it's the reason sending kind of works again? Like if, if those things were out and about lots of places, that was like part of the disruption it was doing was sending. And so now that like, Hmm. They're they're deactivated them there and are bringing them here for whatever reason. Maybe that's why it kind of works again. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm still like the more like Aorian technology we see, the more I'm like convinced lewdness is from Aor or heavily. His backstory is heavily tied to it. Yeah. Um, cause the Malleus key is basically a derivation of that. Um, the, whatever it was called, uh, de facto Malleus or whatever. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, and then we know he's got constructs that a- Aorian, uh, or Aomorton, excuse me. Um, and then now these devices too. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's gotta be right. If not if not like literally from there, which I feel like he probably would be, but closely tied to it. Cause it also explains his hatred for the gods, right? Like they yeah. destroyed his home. Um, yeah. Which <clears throat> I don't know. Also calls into question of Frida and that vision, you know, like not that, not that, not that the connection has to directly be lewdness, but I wonder if that like little boy was lewdness in, in Frida's, or was the implication that like Frida was the little boy before she got turned into a robot or something? I don't know. I need to go back and like watch that yeah, section. I don't but... know. It's definitely like I think purposely ambiguous from yeah. that. But but yeah. But yeah, I I I I think definitely that you know if he ends up not being from Aor or like, <laughs> you know, something completely out of left field, I would be really surprised. Aor? Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I will say um, one other criticism, which is too strong of a word in today's, you know, toxic fandom world. Yeah. But one other like critique I had was 
how easily the party has been navigating through Creviris. Um, and it seems like we got confirmation at the end of this episode that the real city of Creviris is uh, underneath the surface, or at least like the, um, I maybe I shouldn't say the real city, but you know, we were told as much like there's like the different like levels of society, yeah. you know? And um, maybe there just hasn't been, maybe it's been sort of easy to like stealth through because security wise, they don't really care about, you know, the, I don't say the podunky, but like, you know, yeah. it's like, eh, it's like the slums right. kind of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You probably wouldn't see like a lot of security guards, like in the slums of a city. <laughs> right. So. See, I, I yeah. think, I think that makes sense. Um, and kind of on the, kind of on the same track, we didn't really see this until the very end of this episode, but um, Imogen looking like her mother seems to have purchased them a lot of clout. You know, mm -hmm. which I was, we knew Liliana was important because, you know, she's, Ludinus even said as much that like, she's been a great help in this whole mission. Um, Like we knew she was a high ranking officer, but even knowing that I still felt like well, we even learned more about her and just the reaction these people had to Imogen. Like they almost were like revering her, you know, like, like a, yeah, it's like a war hero. Almost. Yeah. Like a, like, you know, they just wanted to get a pick, you know, like, or the autograph real quick. So I'm curious, like, I don't know. I mean, maybe just because she is so important that like, there is kind of this legend around her, like, maybe, you know, maybe it's less of like specific deeds that are attributed to her, but like these people, their whole legend is they're going to be saved and they get to go to Exandria and they know that like mm -hmm. Ludinus is top dog and you know, Liliana's right there. So maybe it's just kind of like de facto clout, but mm -hmm. if it is more specific, I'm really curious like what she has done to gain this revelry as it were. And is she, you know, is she one of the most in tune is she an exaltant? Is that a safe assumption or she has to be, I would say. Yeah. So, I mean, does she have like the strongest connection to Pradathos? I'm not sure. Yeah. That would, I mean, it would make sense to me, especially with how important Imogen seems to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Also well, Imogen yeah. can, continues with the crazy deception roles like for the past yeah. three episodes she like hey you know brennan brennan lee mulligan says the dice tells a story and i mean they have it's not even like you know barely meeting the dc like we're talking like 20s and above <laughs> yeah on these checks so um so yeah i mean it's happening but um looking at my notes uh this these five masters of the weave mind. Yeah. So part of me where my mind went to was like, are we going to have like a 30 episode arc of them? Like taking out one by one of like the, the weave mind. But then again, I'm like, I don't know. There's just still this tension of like time and urgency. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's left. Do we have 10 episodes left or 30 episodes left? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's kind of like informing, my perception of like what they're going to do next. And I mean, they have this central spire down below, which they're probably keen to get to. Um, I don't know. What do you think like the next steps for them is going to be? Yeah, I think that I don't see it necessarily being like a, a long arc of like hunting down weave mine by weave mine. I bet they're almost, I don't want to say always, but probably like together most of the time. Um, but it, kind of beside the point, I actually was feeling like after this meeting that they're having right now, and it seems like they may be with the way the episode ended, they might like be going in to the city a bit. I don't know if they mm -hmm. are or not, but um, even if they are though, it feels like at the end of this meeting, I feel like they have sufficient things to take back now. So like recon mission done, like let's go reconvene, tell Keyleth and everyone what we learned. And then we can make like the, the final move. And I know this is something you and I have, we've talked about at length for several episodes of like, will they ever actually go back 
to Exandria and have the completion of the recon mission, or is the recon mission going to turn into the turn into yeah. the end game? Well, I feel like this, if ever, like now is the time they could turn around because like they don't currently have heat on them and they have a lot of actionable information to like actually take back. Um, I don't know which way they'll go because like especially if there is like a let's go into the underground city like they might get lost in plot threads or, you know, danger. Something might happen. Um, So I'm just curious to see if they like follow path A or they go you know, fill everybody in on what they learned because they've learned a lot. I feel like we know about this hidden faction, the volition. Um, they got this Aorian technology that they can talk about. And, you know, uh, they found out about the weave mind. They know about the Boromoto and these other like factions on Rudis that are by and large, innocent bystanders, you know, in terms of nuke the whole planet. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I, what do you think? Like I kind of am team, I hope they go back and report now, but I don't know that they will. I got bad news, Will. All right. What's that? If this was like an NPC telling of a story, the these this party would absolutely go back. (laughs) However, this is a live well, not live, but these are players of a DD group and they are going to push the button. (laughs) They are going to have the option to go into the city, presumably make their way towards that central spire making their way yeah and you know so i'm i'm with you it like now is the perfect time to go back and report there's no way it's happening <laughs> they, they, they're not going back they, it just it'd be too clunky it'd be like it just, it just isn't going to happen they have the little you know um grave mine seed that they got to they got to drop down in there true you know it just seems like, and maybe Matt might even take the option away. And maybe like Rashina, this golden hammer is like, this is what you're going to do for us. And, <clears throat> you know, you're going to go down and kill one of the five. I don't know. And it's like, we've shown you our secret base. So like, we can't let you just leave. Like you need to do this now. Um, I could see maybe even Matt doing something like that mm-hmm. where it's like, yep, you're going to do this. Um, so, so yeah, I think they're going deeper into the city for sure. And I'm excited because it's very, uh, we talked about this a couple episodes ago. It's very dungeon dive esque, yeah. you know, not like a long winded dungeon, but just like deeper into the pit, you know, the belly yeah. of the beast. So it's very exciting. <clears throat> um, and really the first time it's happened this campaign. So in, in that exact context, yeah. obviously but anyway i'm excited yeah. I'm excited for thursday and it's been fun watching i got i'm glad i got to watch it live last thursday i'll be able to this thursday too so nice i'm excited for that nice me i i think i should be able to as well so that'll be fun and i wonder if so i don't i mean i hear where you're coming from but i'm still torn i, I hope they do go back but we'll we'll see um <clears throat> just because if they i don't know We've talked about this at length. I won't I won't dive into it again, but I don't know, man. I feel like I feel like they're in trouble if this if Hang this on, is my, the my final smoke alarms. My smoke alarm's going off. Okay. Well, I will just yap to you guys then. Um and this is the same conversation we've had, but you know, since since I'm alone here, I'm gonna indulge myself. Um I just <clears throat> if this does feel like the perfect time to reconvene. So like if it's not now, I definitely think it's never in terms of, you know, like this will just lead into the final ruinous portion. Uh, not that that means it'll be the end of the campaign, but like, i.e. they won't go back to Exandria and then come back. Right. And I feel like they really need to. Like there's a lot of information they have that the people in Exandria need. Obviously, they at least gave Keyleth the breadcrumbs of how to find the secret portal. So that's at play already, which I think is the most important thing. Um, Sorry. No, you're good. House. Okay. I was like, is everything okay? Like, yeah. I was like, (laughs) all right. All right, then. Um, I was just saying that, like, what I've already said, that I feel like this, this is their last chance to, to go home. And, and give yeah. this information. If it if it doesn't happen here, I don't think it's happening. 
Um, but yeah, I just feel like there's some, I feel like they're not ready. Like, I feel like they need to, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know if they're going to recruit allies or, or what, like, I don't think, you know, I don't know. So that's been kind of the theme of the whole campaign though. Like yeah, this power gap, you know, I'm more yeah. curious. Like it, I still feel like they're going to fight Anahan soon. And I'm more curious, like yeah. how do they get her alone? Like how would, how was that setting going to come about where they fight her and they're not just swarmed by the weave mind and all these other things. Yeah. That's a good point actually. Cause now I'm wondering like let's say they do try to go home i guess they could just tell like if they actually were like let's go home right now they could just teleport from where they are to the right to the portal right but i was thinking like what if they were like all right let's let's leave and they run because odahan's there she's in the city where they're at right. so i was wondering right. like maybe they would like leave and run into odahan and there would be like that mini boss fight like right now mm. um but i mean you're i think <clears throat> I mean, you're right that it doesn't really make sense that they would be able to take that fight in a vacuum. But I think just by nature of D&D, Matt would somehow give that to them. You know, whether it's like, yeah. I think Odohan will have like some guards with her, but that will just be right. part of the encounter. Like they have to deal with them as well. But then like if hypothetically, if it does happen in in this city, not the underground city, but like if they decide to go back and they fight her in the slums that like the like the townsfolk everybody will like run away. So I think it would be like sort of self-contained in that way, but yeah. I don't know. Well, let me ask you this. If the party does go back, what what do they do from there? Like they report and then they all right, we're going to head back now. I mean, like what? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that Yeah, I mean functionally I don't think the stakes would change that much. Like it would just be Yeah we give you guys the information like maybe they get like a, a, an additional like npc party member to help them or something or some new items or whatever but it would ultimately just end up being them back in the same position of like going into the city so by that like narrative structure like really not much would change but i feel like it is just important for them to like kind of regather themselves and share the information they learned, but also maybe like maybe sending it even becomes more clear and more working and they can just send a message while still on route as to Alexandria. And then there, I guess there's no reason for them to go back. I think it'd be interesting if they came back to report and then Pradathos, like they waited too long and Pradathos mm. gets freed and then, you know, there's anarchy and chaos and maybe they eventually do go back to Ruidus. I don't know, but yeah, it could be interesting. So yeah, but uh, anything else? Not not a lot to talk about, I guess. Um, anything else from this episode that comes to mind that you want to chat about? Um, this is not really a, a chat about subject, and I think the the sort of the Aorian thing, the disruptive thing that they got. I think they will probably use it in some way, but I was also thinking it would be cool if they used the harness on it and like what that would, what that would give to somebody. So I kind of hope that they try that, but it might be like too important of a, an item to destroy in that way. But I thought it would be cool. Like even if like FCG did it it would kind of have like an extra layer of cool. Um, Poor Matt having to create uh... (laughs) a, What if we use this item? Uh, that one <laughs> different, but better. <laughs> you get an extra two HP. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah. The yeah. only other thing that I put down that I wanted to talk about was I thought it was interesting that there was a dragonborn amongst these, these, the resistance. And I think a few gnomes were also mentioned. Yeah. So like, yeah. and they, what, was the dragonborn the leader or did I, was it the I dragonborn that, just I mentioned? Had, I had that exact same confusion. Um, and I actually, I still have, Oh no, I don't. I was gonna say, I still have the, uh, yes, I do. It's right here. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, Rashina. No, she's a real Lauren. We asked okay. about this. In the, I, I asked in the watch party though, if Rashina was the dragonborn, mm-hmm. 
or if she was Ray Lauren. Um, okay. Someone clarified that she was Ray Lauren, but all right, that makes more guards, sense. Yeah, I think one of the guards was, which is interesting. Yeah, it could be like people who've been recruited away from the Ruby Vanguard. Like once they got here, they joined the Volition. But I feel like that, that has what, to be what it. Interesting detail, though. Yeah, which. It, it either has to be that like Vanguard members that were turned, which I'm curious how that happened, you know, yeah. like especially to be so trusted that you're part of like the leaders guards right. now. Um, right. So I think it's either a turncoat situation, which makes me wonder, could they be a spy? Like a double cross mm. situation, but also the only other explanation would be like it's a previous Right. Like alliance member that went to Rudis somehow to, you know, but I would guess not since the alliance doesn't didn't even really know about the volition. Um, right. Yeah, really curious about that Dragonborn and the other humanoids stories right. that were there, um, which we may not. Maybe Matt was just like, all right, there's a Dragonborn and <laughs> there's a three Ray Lauren. Like, you know, I'm sure that wasn't the case. Like, I'm sure there is more depth behind it, and but they, it might not be something we ever uh, yeah. find out. <laughs> and a dwarf. Sure. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. And a uh, hobbit. And you're like, wait, what? What's happening? Okay. Brutal. Um, but yeah, uh, the only other thing I'm sad is that we didn't get to see Chetney's toy because they didn't need it on that, yeah. on that yeah. guard. So how many does he have? Just one or multiple uses? I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. But I, I also like kind of the recurring, the legend of of chetney claws Ch- that's claws, yeah that's being built um yeah that's pretty good i like that camera where it was but they were like maybe it was imogen and lana coming back from the tower with erot and sam was like you gotta you gotta mention chetney claws to keep the you know we gotta build this legend yeah. and they're like no <laughs> stop yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, sh- short episode. I feel it was, yeah. one of the shortest re- of recent memory, I think. Um, yeah. Which, and okay, you know, obviously it's still almost four hours long. So like, you know, we're using short in a relative term here, but I also like the last four or five have felt short on the shorter end. Like they've mostly been like right around four hours. So um, not that that, yeah. not that there's any like, intentionality behind run times but i'm curious if like we're about to come up on a i guess yeah. the next longer one would be probably like when there's a big battle with, i'm gonna um, guess also that's i'm gonna guess that's also partly matt i don't say like running out of things to do but just like now's probably a good stopping point and I, it happens to me a lot in yeah. D where it's just like okay i haven't fully fleshed that out or i need some more time to let that cook but you got there quicker most more often it's like i plan out like all this runway and they make like one step yeah. you know it's like been two hours in the session they're still in the same room you know <laughs> but um matt mentioned um the break at the caravan where fcg and fern were caught by Adahan. Mm-hmm. um him calling the break because he had to go like put together like the battle map because <laughs> it wasn't he didn't yeah. expect that to happen yeah and so he had to be like, all right, we're going to take a break, you know? <laughs> and so, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's still a home D and D game as best yeah. as you can call it that. Um, so I could see like, you know, you're in like an expansive world. The party could go literally anywhere. Um, so I, I kind of, that all kind of makes sense to me, but yeah, we'll see. We shall. I'm curious to see how long this week's episode is. Yeah. No. But yeah, that's, anyway. uh, that's all I got really. Well, uh, we'll have the watch party for the next Critical Role episode this Thursday. If you guys want to tune in with us, you can check the link in the description for our <clears throat> Discord. We have our live stream on Friday where we're going to be doing our giveaway uh, winner announcement. Um, and then our watch Sunday fun day watching Sicario at uh, Sunday at 730 Central. Um, and then we'll be back from there. So yep, I'm excited. So be sure to um, enter our giveaway, guys, if you want the chance to play with us in the one shot. Again, it's in the Discord, a channel called Tomb Giveaway. There's just a little button you'll have to press to enter. Um, yeah. yeah, you got and, three days, two days, really. Yeah. yeah. So, 
All right. All righty. See ya.